Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IIST and I will be the moderator for today's webinar, Internet of Things, How Does It Impact Testing and QA by Jennifer Bonin. We're excited you're able to join us today, set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one of a series of free webinars to introduce the topics as well as the presenters of the upcoming PSQT conference in San Diego, California, August 14th through the 19th at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel and Marina. PSQT is the only conference that focuses on practical best practices in every aspect of software quality assurance and testing. The ongoing theme of the conference, practical, proven, feasible, keeps the focus on what works. To learn more about this exciting conference, visit psqtconference.com. You may submit your questions at any time by using your question box in your GoToWebinar window. Today's presenter will answer as many questions within the time allowed at the end of today's session. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing within 48 hours at psqtconference.com. At the end of today's webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey. At IIST, we strive to provide the highest quality educational resources for the public and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete this short survey. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Jennifer Bonin. Jennifer? Thank you. What we'll do today is try and give you guys an introduction to some of the things that I've been seeing as we're meeting and talking with different clients and customers. What I want to stress is that the best way to get it, to talk about this is to have dialogues about it. So you see that first slide there where we're showing all the people with the dialogue boxes above them. What we want to do is open up the discussion because I'm sure a lot of you based on your interest are seeing a lot of talk about the Internet of Things. So I want to get people chatting about it. Hopefully um, you guys will have some questions at the end and absolutely um, a good place to have these dialogues is at conferences like the one coming up in August where we can talk through your specific issues and challenges that you guys are facing. And now we want to delve a little bit more into what does this actually mean. So on the next slide, we actually look at what this means to us and some of what we're seeing. So what we see now in today's world is we're shopping on our phones we're actually using our phones as payment mechanisms and gateways. We're actually using mobile um, to give us data and information. A lot of you may be seeing that your consumers and users and the people you work with are asking for you to provide reporting on QA and statistics and releases, not only on you know, your phones and through email, but people are viewing that information on their cell phones. You have people working out in the field on non-traditional devices. So instead of people just using the traditional laptops or desktops, we're now starting to use things like tablets out at construction sites and in the field. So no matter what industry you're in, if you develop software or not, if you have a product or service, you're now having to think about how to connect that device to many other devices out there. It's also imperative that you have interfaces through your mobile that people are willing to engage with. Our tolerance with all of these mobile devices and apps is much shorter than what our tolerance used to be with your traditional applications. So if you're having to service consumers who are using mobile devices and applications, that tolerance for being able to um, have a good user experience has gotten much lower than what we used to see in the past. So testing is becoming more and more critical for us in this. Next. We're becoming more social is what they say, right? We have all these social networks. We have all these social mediums to get data. So theoretically, all of this um, access has got, made us more social. But what we actually see, next, is things like we eat dinner together but don't actually talk to each other. Families are engaging in new ways that we've never seen before. So what you'll see is you can walk into a household today and every individual in that house is on some type of communication or device, not necessarily even having the opportunity to engage directly with each other. I'm sure many of you, if we had the opportunity to open it up and ask you, how many of you are guilty of this? You sent text messages or you sent communications to someone sitting only a few feet away from you rather than getting up and going to talk to them. So a lot of what's happening now is we engage through these devices versus face-to-face. -face. So there's a lot that can get lost in translation and we have to be very good as QA professionals at making sure the translation makes sense to the consumers and the users 
who are going to engage and interact with it. Because again, we don't have that opportunity to explain it to them. They have to just understand it in a very quick way through their devices that they're engaging and interacting with us on. Next. So what we tend to see is we have to have new ways to get through, not only to our own families, but to consumers to make sure that we're able to service the needs that they have through their mobile and now their new devices and Internet of Things that they'll be engaging with. Next. The other interesting thing that we're seeing is a trend of we're all interconnected. So I'm sure a lot of us have experienced this in our professions as QA professionals, that something goes wrong on a release and everyone's pointing fingers at who caused the problem or where the issue actually resides. In testing today, it's not a single application that we're concerned about anymore. It may work on the desktop version, but the mobile version for some reason isn't working. Or our mobile version's working, but it's not working on this particular version of iOS. It's not working on this version of Android. What you'll also tend to see is the executives in your organization are using those same devices so that they are expecting that everything works seamlessly on their tablet, their mobile device, their laptop, anywhere they're engaging with that. So what we tend to find is that we can not point fingers and say, I'm sure this is an issue on your side. It all comes together in our testing. Next. Back in my day, so when I started this, I don't know how long many of you have been in your profession or in testing, but here's what we used to have not that long ago. Next slide. So what we used to see, I'm sure many of you remember this, is that we delivered software through disk, right? So CDs had a lot of the information that we needed and we would load those into drives. Now, many, now today, many of the machines that we utilize to do our work don't even have disk drives in them anymore, right? They're externalized. So there used to be this concept of we could put things on a disk and that lived on for a period of time, be it a year, six months, several years, and it was a living, breathing thing that we could spend a year to test and then deliver. That's not the case anymore. We deliver much more rapidly than that. We used to have those cables that we plugged everything into so we were physically hardwired and connected to something. No longer the case, right? Cell phones used to be much bigger than they are today and weren't something that everyone carried around and used routinely. Now I bet if I asked all of you, how many of you, if you left your cell phone at home, would go back and turn around and get it versus going a whole day without it, right? So many of us can't even stand to go a day without a cell phone now, whereas before there was a time not that long ago in the 90s where we didn't even carry cell phones on a regular basis, but we become dependent on them. Google was just a brainchild of, of some guys in a university thinking about something that would allow us to search and get data and information. And the first laptops were just coming out and they were much, much bigger and heavier than what we're seeing now in our very, very thin, light laptops that people carry around today. Next. What we have seen is then that we started to evolve from software being delivered through the mail in a CD to our desktops, and things started to get much more interesting. Next slide. We had a lot more complexity that we added. We've got a digital hub now, right? And thinking back, I mean, if you actually look at when this came out, it's 2002. So we're not even talking about that long ago where we were thinking about creating these digital hubs and having things that started to get connected and devices that could connect in, right? So externalizing iPods and having music that sat outside of our computer, downloading pictures or photos that we took digitally that could now go into our computers, having video that we could now um, put on the computer and have in multiple places. Things have gotten a lot more complex, and we're just talking about the early 2000s here. We're not even talking about what we're entering into right now. Next slide. We entered into high-speed internet and ethernet connections. And what's amazing is what we didn't, what I think we failed to remember only about eight, nine years ago, we're coming up on nine years now, but it's only been since June of 2007 that those handy things called iPhones that many of us depend on actually came out. 
The first iPhone was in June of 2007. And it wasn't until July of 2008 that we had the concept of the App Store and putting apps on a phone and having applications that would drive those phones. So again, we're relatively new into this. And what you see, if you hit the next slide, is that we had this explosion of apps and being able to push data information, content, and deliver applications onto people's devices whenever they needed it. Many of us have children, probably, that don't even remember a time when there wasn't an iPhone, but those children are seven, eight years old, and that's all they've ever known. But before that, we didn't have access to these types of devices and information readily at our fingertips. What's also interesting for those of you out there who may be managing folks who came into this digital explosion and are maybe in their first job in their careers is this is how they've learned. So when Google came around in the mid-90s, the way that people get information now, and many of us do, is you can just Google it. You go onto the web, you can check prices, you can do price checks amongst multiple vendors. This didn't used to be the way the rest of us had to research information, many, you know, even in the 80s. The way we had to get information was we had to go find that information either in books, you know, other places. We didn't have access to the level of information that we have today. But with that access comes a responsibility of ensuring the information, the data, the applications we're putting out there are able to work properly, that they function, that we understand what, what they're doing, and that we present correct information out to the consumer. Because that's your brand image, ultimately. Next slide. Today we have a very rich and complex environment that we're all dealing with from a testing standpoint. We don't have these, like I said, individual applications we need to be concerned with. We have these complex network of applications that have to work seamlessly together. I was just talking to a client this morning about the challenge of they have a 24 by 7 data center that they had to migrate. The downtime that they're allowed to have when they're operating their operations center because they operate high power equipment and dams that provide electricity to the country. Imagine if that went down for even a few minutes. You're taking that entire plant offline. You're not able to do that. They also have trading where you're trading on the open market 24 hours a day, the energy futures. So if they were to take that down when they migrated to their new building for even a minute, two minutes, the impact to the business is huge and you're talking millions of dollars in impact for a failure. So that then relies on our testing and our QA organization to think about what are all the scenarios that we're going to run into and what do we have to take into account when we test it. And testing, besides just understanding the business impact, we're truly having to understand the user interface and how people will actually use the applications that are being built by someone else and designed. Next slide. So today's environment, if we build this slide out, what we'll see is now, I'm sure all of you have run into this in your testing, right? So now it's not about we just have Internet Explorer or Chrome or Firefox. You've got multiple ways that people come in through multiple different operating systems. Then you've got people have, who have their loyalties to their individual um, devices. So you're going to have the lovers of Android. You have the Apple lovers, the Windows lovers. And depending on how your structure is set up, you need to understand from a testing perspective which of those is the most critical to your particular set of user group. So the question I would ask you guys to think of that is, how many of you out there know what percentage of your users use what percentage of those browsers? And what percentage of your users are using which percentage of those Apple, Android, and Windows devices? And do you up that, update that on a regular basis? Because what that tells us is, when you're looking at testing, Understanding where the bulk and the majority of your consumers are going to actually interface with that application is critical. Because you want to know if, for example, my um, mobile app goes down, that my CEO is running on an Apple device and they're running on this version and they're primarily, primarily accessing it through this browser. You want to know those things, as well as the majority of your general consumers and population who are going to be taking in whatever it is that you and your team are responsible for testing at the end of the day. Next slide. What we're seeing is all of these things actually are very interconnected. The trends in mobile, as I mentioned, that's where people want to interface. 
That's where they want to get their information, and that's how they want to even consume and buy. What we're seeing as a trend is that the average user engages with their mobile device 200 times a day. You think about that, right? How many times do you actually pick up your phone to check an email, check a text message, look at Facebook, buy something online, go to an app, play a game? And we say that 85% say that mobile devices are a central part of their everyday life. What that means to all of us is that mobile is the wave of the future and where everyone's going. So, do you have a good strategy around your mobile application testing? Have you thought through which application devices that you're going to support and made sure that you've got a regression test suite that can support that? Next slide. Amazon in 2014 said that 60% of their Christmas traffic was mobile. People actually don't want to go to the physical store anymore. They like being able to compare prices online, click a button, and then have it delivered to their doorstep. They don't actually have to go out, interact with other consumers. They have the capability to do all of that online. We actually found that there were 18 toys a second on Cyber Monday that were moved. So again, seeing that trend of most people are going to your mobile sites or your website to do a lot of their interaction and business means that you have to have much more focus from a testing perspective on your mobile applications and devices. What I would also ask you to think about is how frequently are you guys pushing content? So what we tend to see is when you deliver content on a CD or a disk drive, you weren't delivering it all that often because it required some act to physically get information out to the consumer. You may be released once or twice a year. Now what we're seeing with mobile is you're having to keep pace with the industry and the other folks out there and make changes on a regular basis. What we see is in some instances it's multiple times a day. And when you talk about making changes multiple times a day, what is your strategy to ensure that those changes are actually getting tested appropriately and that something major isn't getting missed? Next slide. So where are we going and where do I see kind of the trend taking place for all of us and as we talk about Internet of Things and this interconnectivity? Next slide. So here's what the wave of the future is and what we're seeing. So for call centers, so any of you out there who have a product or a service that relies on a call center or someone calling in to get customer service, is that there's going to have to be a way that your call center can interact directly with the consumer sitting out in the field. So being able to troubleshoot with them, besides just being able to, we used to think that it was sophisticated if we could VPN into someone's system and take a look at it and then take over their machine. Now what you're going to have to be able to do is have a way for consumers to show you the problem they're actually facing, and that could be with an external product or device, you know, even that they're interfacing with. And what we'll also see is that you may not be physically co-located with whoever is helping you, right? So in the picture on the right, the dad is in another location helping his daughter troubleshoot how to fix her plumbing. And he can do that virtually. They're talking about moving more that way for things even like personal trainers, where the personal trainer could be located in one location and the people they're servicing are physically in a different location. So what does that mean to us from a testing perspective and where our skills need to go? We again have to be very cognizant of what the end use is and how people are going to want to interface and interact with our products and identify ways that isn't just actual defects in the product when it comes to the technology behind the scenes, but defects in the UX and the user experience coming in and trying to use these products, these applications, these technologies as they're interfacing with us. Next slide. The near future looks challenging, but that doesn't scare me. So what else is out there that possibly could be a little frightening? Next slide. So this whole big Internet of Things, and there's a lot of people talking about it, and why I think a lot of people are interested is we hear this term out there, and we're saying, what does this actually mean, and what is the impact to me, and what's going to end up happening? And really what it talks about is all of the things that we have in our life at some point need open ability to be connected to something else, whether that's your coffee maker that automatically sends you a text message that says your coffee's ready, and you can actually go downstairs and know that it's set to go. It may be your hot tub that you have installed in your backyard that when it gets low on a particular chemical 
actually is connected to your Amazon account, which then purchases new versions of that chemical and has it automatically shipped to your house to be able to be put into it. We have technology today in our manufacturing where we have lawnmowers that actually are connected to the servicing mechanism. So the lawnmower will get an alert that says it's time to be serviced, which will then be sent to a scheduler who will actually call you up and schedule that service to be done on your lawnmower. It's opening up that connectivity to just about everything that's out there to be able to be connected to something else and then pushing that data across multiple places. Next slide. So what you'll start to see is everything's interconnected and that there's connection points between just about everything in our lives to something else. A lot of you maybe even physically wear some of those devices yourself. So we're seeing the trend in wearables the Fitbits that are out there. I don't know how many of you, it would be interesting. Um, it's so hard when we do these virtually, but when we're in person at the conferences, we talk about things like what percentage of you is getting into the wearable space, or where do you think you'll be and will you be in that space? A lot of industries that didn't technically think that would be a space they would get into are now seeing that there's some applicability to a wearable or having to test a wearable component inside of their technologies because now they're being put on these wearable devices for some reason. I'll give you an example. Right now in the healthcare field what I'm seeing is that instead of patients who have diabetes physically pricking their finger and having to take their blood sugar tests and their levels, they're creating patches that would, people would wear, so a wearable patch that you would put on your arm. That patch then interfaces with software that talks to an app that's loaded on your cell phone that you can then get information about your blood sugar levels on a reoccurring basis multiple times throughout the day. That information is then shipped and sent off to your doctors and care providers so they know exactly where you're sitting and if you're at a critical level or if something needs to be done with that information. Now that all sounds great, right? The challenge with that is how do we secure it? How do we make sure that that data isn't being exposed to other people that it shouldn't be exposed to? Very similar to, I'm sure a lot of you are watching the news on the Apple legislation on being able to get into a cell phone and access the data and the information. The reason that that is such a hot button right now for a lot of people in technology is, if you give access to the federal government to do that and you open that up, now who's to say someone else can't hack into that as well and get into it when it's unauthorized? And then that opens all of us up to privacy issues that we haven't yet even seen the likes of. So we've seen some of it in the news, but there's even bigger issues coming with that impending decision on what's going to happen with opening up that type of access and allowing people in. Next slide. So what we're seeing is everything is getting connected in our world if we build on this, right? Everything is talking to everything else. So testers, traditionally, how many of you could raise your hand and say, we have a lab in our office where we test our applications, our software, our mobile devices? Well, think about this. No longer is the lab just the stuff that you have. What we're talking about, and I don't know how many of you have seen it yet, is that the labs of the future for testing, and I know this sounds crazy, it probably sounds like what all of us used to think of as you know, futuristic technology at one point and, you know, the likes of Star Wars and the Jetsons and things like that. But what we're talking about is the new testing labs of the future will be actual real life apartment settings, homes, many cities. And that we'll actually be doing is testing those applications in their real world application use out in the field, so to speak. And that there will be these labs or, or cities set up for those particular testing times or applications where you as a a company could go in and test your products in a real world situation, right? So something that we think we'll see a lot of in the future is labs and QA and the actual testing not being done so much in isolation in our own organizations or companies, but pushing that out to a lab city <laughs> where you actually go out and you're doing the testing in a real world, quote, field application of that technology. Next slide. Complicated, we're getting there, but we still haven't seen everything yet. Next slide. Besides all these interconnected points, all of the um, browsers, operating systems, different devices we're going to have to connect to, different versions of those devices, 
people are using various ways to interconnect with them. Next slide. What we're going to see is it's everything now. So everything is talking to everything else. And even things that we don't know are talking to each other will need to talk to each other. So what does that mean for us? Next slide. Still not the most complicated thing that we'll see, but next slide. We have to worry about now how do we secure all of this. And I talked a little bit about that. Next slide. Here's the thing. We've seen a little bit of it in recent history in the news even. Once you start connecting all of these things, who else can get in and access that information? So everyone's heard about people hacking into companies and basically holding the data for ransom and threatening to publish it. You've also seen where people have actually gone in when companies have refused to hand over the, the ransom or whatever they're asking, that they've published the data publicly on public websites. I wonder if many of you have heard about the Ashley Madison scandal that went across the entire country where they actually hacked into that organization and company and then made public all of the consumer buying information of all of the potential customers of that company. Now what that gets us into is if people can do that, how safe is it for you to work with that company and share your personal data and information with them? All of us probably think about this as consumers day to day when we go in and interact with a company. We should all be thinking about every time we use our credit card, who has access to that? Will they be able to take that and use that again? So even as consumers, we should be concerned about the level of security. Then take it another level and say, as testers, what do we have to think about? And what is the implication of people having access to the data and the information? Or what can a single breach do to our company? I'm sure some of you heard about Target and the security breach that they had. What ends up happening when we have those breaches is that we end up needing to provide some compensation to people for the breaches that they're seeing. So Target ended up paying out millions and millions of dollars, upwards of almost a billion dollars, to fix the issue that they had in their testing with their security. So us as QA professionals have a huge burden now to also think about how are we securing these devices, how are we securing the data and the applications. It's no longer just about does the functionality work and will it work on multiple devices with multiple operating systems, do I have open connections that people can get into, but how do I secure those same connections and data. Next slide. So it's a little scary, right? That starts to scare me when we start talking about the data breach implications, the access to information, people's ability to get in and take that information and use it. That should scare all of us as testing professionals. Next slide. There's an importance on penetration testing and security testing. So if some of you aren't familiar with it, get familiar with penetration testing and security testing. You don't have to be experts in it, but what I would recommend for all QA professionals is that we get a handle on the different types of testing that can be done around penetration, um, what the mentality is, the approach that needs to be taken. We have some awareness of the tools out there and the strategies that are available. The increasing complexity and risk with all the access points that we've opened up to and basically understanding that a lot of organizations, ones we work in, could only be one major failure away from having to close our doors based on the size of the company that we're working in. So again, what I would encourage you, and we only get a short amount of time to spend together today, one of the things I would hope you walk away with is, if you haven't already, understanding the different types of security testing, penetration testing, what your strategy is in your organization, what's being done, if there is a group handling it, what impact that is to your testing organization if you're not handling it, and is it covered, and has someone really thought about this? Next slide. History has lessons that can help us. We've seen things from the past that help us with how to handle the future. Next slide. It's hard to create or pick a winner. I can't tell you what the next iPhone craze is going to be that we'll all have to get on board with and test and be ready for. But, next slide. I look at it as the iceberg approach. So if we build this slide, you'll see that basically if you think of it as an iceberg, right? If we go back to this slide, yep. If you think of it as an iceberg, above the line is what your consumer sees. It's their interface to your applications and your products and services. 
Below the surface is what makes your product unique and special and is why people come and interface with you. So testing that secret sauce is the importance of how to understand how we're going to get by in this next boom of things that's happening. What makes you special? What makes you important? Making sure that you're hitting on those things for your particular consumers and users of your product, services, and application. Next slide. What we tend to find is a lot of times in our organizations, not us as QA professionals, but our developers, our architects, they'll try and pick winners. And they'll say, this is the direction we're going to go, and it's going to be this technology. So how many of you remember the Blu-ray controversy when we had um, multiple vendors come out with technology that was supposed to be the latest and greatest next generation technology? There was two primary companies that came out in that race. One ended up winning, one ended up losing. But there wasn't a way to know which one it was going to be. So what we're going to have to do as testers and in our organizations is make sure we're ready for whoever the next winner could be. Next slide. So what you're going to have to do if we build on this is support multiple open APIs to connect to these things and allow that connectivity. So as a tester, what you should be thinking about in this regard is how open is my system to be able to connect to whoever the next winner could be? Because we don't know what it'll be even yet. So am I allowing that openness to be able to get into multiple different ways of who the next version of the next iOS, the next iPhone, whatever the next thing will be, are we allowing ourselves to be open and plugged in easily into whatever that could be? So again, that openness by nature is what we all need. The scary part of that is actually securing it and testing it for all of us. We have to have that openness and allow that, but at the same time make sure we protect that secret sauce below the surface are testing the right things when we deliver and release to our consumers and are keeping it open but making sure it's secure. Next slide. Beware of disruptors as well because the ones we think might be the winner or the way that things will go can often get disrupted. Next slide. This is interesting. In 2010, the CEO of BlackBerry actually was quoted as saying, you don't need an app for the web, which is very interesting when we look at where we're today. He obviously is a technology expert who had been in the field a long time, and he even couldn't pick the winner or understand where things would be going. It's impossible for us to do that. Again, the importance of why we need to stay open-minded about what that next thing is going to be that we're going to see that we're going to have to, as testers, worry about how to test it. Next slide. So some of the examples of disruptors that we've seen out there, we used to have newspapers. That's where we wear, went to get information, right? Want ads. Everyone hopefully is not too young to remember the want ad, right? Now Craigslist has overtaken that. It's a fast way to get stuff out there and have people interact with you. We used to have standard sale terminals in stores. Now how many of you have gone into a store where no longer do you actually go to a physical checkout, but what you do if someone's walking around the store with a tablet or a square reader, and you actually can check out anywhere in the store versus having to go to the checkout in the front of the store, things are changing, right? So that means no longer can you test point of sale devices if you're in the business of point of sale or retail. You now have to be able to test a square reader being out in the field in your store somewhere that it has access, connectivity, that everyone can get into it, and that you understand what the implications are if that goes down for you as an organization. We used to have traditional taxis. Now taxis even need technology inside of them to easily be deployed because the reason Uber was able to sneak in and offset the taxi market was because people liked the idea of, again, we talked in the beginning about how mobile we are, so being able to go to your cell phone and access information. So what you want to do with Uber is I can quickly know how close anyone is in my vicinity and when they're going to be there to come pick me up. It's much harder to have to stand on a corner and not know if a taxi is coming and wait. You don't know how long you're waiting. People want access to information instantly, no matter what it is that we're testing. So we're now having to test where we are thinking about how are we getting information directly to the consumer as quickly as possible, and not only information, but accurate information that's giving them something that's value-add to them in their life or making their life easier or simpler. 
Next slide. So basically, as testers, what do we have to do? We have to adapt to what we're seeing, or we get end of lights, right? So our skills will become out of date if we're not learning how to adapt to what's happening around us. And especially for any of you out there that are leaders, you have to be leading the charge for getting your, tech, your skills updated and the skills of the people on your team. Next, next slide. We really also aren't good at getting things right usually the first time or even building the right product the first time. What you tend to see is that things iterate and that they evolve over time. Again, why Agile is so important to us is we want to be able to iterate, make changes, and adapt on the fly. People need to move quicker and get information out to the market and react to the market's reaction to the product that's being delivered. So again, from a testing standpoint, what we're testing today may not be what we're testing tomorrow. Those things could change dramatically. Even the service of what we think we're in the business of doing can change overnight. I'll give you a couple of examples. And there were testers in these organizations who had to adapt. Next slide. So if we build on this slide, what you'll see is there's companies that came out in one aspect and changed to a totally different organization. I'll give you an example. eBay, when we look at what eBay has become today, when they actually first entered the marketplace, eBay wasn't what we know it today, where you can go online and sell goods and buy goods. eBay actually was a payment transaction gateway. So they were looking at how to get money and payments to people. They weren't in the business of putting goods out there and then transacting on those goods. What we see a lot of times is that your company is going to evolve or your goods are going to need to evolve to keep up with the market space. And if they don't keep up, those companies can be end of life as well. You look at Circuit City, for example. Circuit City, Best Buy, some of the organizations saw a huge trend and people are no longer just buying at your storefront. If you've been at an airport lately, you'll see kiosks for Best Buy. You can actually buy Best Buy's technology in an airport. Because where do you need it usually, especially things like cell phone chargers, you know, update um, things for your devices where you no longer have power, cables for your laptops, um, mobile batteries, those types of things. You are usually had forgotten them at home or you needed them for some particular reason. So the best way to do that is to put the access to the product right where the consumer needs it, which is in airports. I've even seen mobile... Um, now in some of the larger airports, and maybe some of you have seen this as well, they're even selling shoes, like slip-on shoes in airports for people that maybe didn't wear the right shoe to the airport or to where their destination. They've got shoes that you can actually purchase from kiosks that are slip-on, that are multiple sizes, um, that people can use or get when they're on the go. So again, thinking about, as QA people, where could this go and what are the possibilities? So I look at part of our role as that you know, exploratory testing is where could this go and what could this be used for? So making sure that we're looking at not just what does the requirement say and what do we think it'll be used for based on what we've been told, but exploring what the potential uses could be for it. Next slide. What we've seen a lot is that those potential uses change quite a bit and us as testers need to be aware of that and looking into it. So it takes a whole team of people to get this right. So you've got to have the people who design and come up with the ideas and innovate. You've then got to have the developers who actually physically developed the application or the software. But then what's really important and kind of at the middle and the crux of this is once that's been done, someone who's looking at it critically to say, how could this be used? What ways could we utilize this? What are the ways that our consumers might use it? And that involves also looking at the data. So I mentioned in the beginning it's important for testers and QA people to understand what percentage of my users are using iPhones, what percentage are using Android. So you can have that information and make sure that you're then making decisions on what and how to test based on who's actually using it and what the application is they're using it for. Then we need to be able to make tweaks quickly. So you see the guy with the wrench. We need to make changes as we need to, be able to deploy and start that cycle all over again. And sometimes that cycle you're looking at right there now for a tester, whereas maybe five years ago was a six to 12 month to 18 month cycle, that cycle has shrunk potentially to days, if not a day. 
for us to be able to do that in React. Next slide. So basically what we need to find and organizations are finding and that I've seen is that basically in order to be really awesome and wow the consumers out there, we need to have testing. It's a critical component to this. I will give you one really interesting statistic out of the World Quality Report that I just saw for this last year. There's a, they predict that the increase in spend will go up by 40% on testing and QA from what it is today in 2016 to 2018. So a 40% increase is what we're going to see. Next slide. So you all maybe or maybe don't remember Carlton, but basically I use this as my happy dance for when companies are looking at what they need to do and how to invest in testing. We all should be investing in this area. It's a place that's going to be critical for all of us as we move forward. Next slide. You can't predict um, how your partners or consumers will want to interact with your services. That's a lesson we know. We just don't know what we don't know about how people, once we put it in their hands, are actually going to want to use whatever we're giving them. So what we've got to do as testers, make sure it's easy, make it flexible, test it in the real world the way our users are going to actually use it. So the closer we can get to the real world application of what's being tested, the better it is. Next slide. So what you tend to see is, we build on this, that we have to be able to understand how this is actually going to be used. Create those open APIs, create multiple ways that companies can access and come into our information, and test it as if we are those consumers. So there's a lot of talk and a lot of, I'm sure, debate, and it gets to be one of those religious debates when you talk about emulators versus physical devices and which is better. What you'll tend to find, I think, as we get more complex and complicated is emulators serve a purpose in my mind, just my opinion. They serve a purpose and are useful, especially on things that aren't your primary mode of the way your users are going to access your technology. But when it comes to how your users are actually accessing it the majority of the time, I would make sure I have that physical device. The reason I say that is I'm sure the last thing all of us as testers want to do is be called into one of the executive's offices because his iPad or his cell phone didn't work with our new app that we loaded on it for our product. So I would say physical devices are always very important. Be careful where you use emulators. They obviously have a place. But be conscious of where that makes sense for you and your organization. Next slide. But I'm not a software company is what you're telling me, right? So Jennifer, I'm not a software company. We don't make software for a living. Why does this matter to me? Next slide. Well, we would have said Lego isn't a software company either, and they don't make software, right? We're all familiar with the little bricks and the blocks and the toys that Lego makes. But what Lego found out is that there's a huge market out there to make your product more interactive with the consumer. So what they said is, while our Legos are just toys and bricks and blocks, what we can do is turn ourselves into an interactive technology company where we can actually interact or engage with our consumer. So you as testers may find people are saying, how do I get to interact or engage with your products or services? What's the best way to do that? There may be apps or things out there that you as testers think of that would allow more engagement and interaction and brand loyalty with your products. So I always say some of the best ideas, especially in our Agile teams, don't always come from product development or developers. It comes from our testers. So be encouraging your testers and yourselves to think about what other ways and what other uses could we have to engage more deeply with the consumer? Next slide. As the device gets more personal to our users, design and usability testing are increasingly important. I would ask how many of you are actually do, thinking about design and usability testing, and is that factored into your testing plans? Devices are so personal, next slide, that we can't forget about the multi-generations that are actually using these devices, right? Next slide. So you have people out there that are using these devices, and one of the reasons actually voice texting came out was actually for older people in the consumer marketplace. It's hard for them to type on a tiny cell phone. So what you started to see is devices got bigger, bigger screens for people to be able to see the information, better capability to text on. 
Are you thinking about how easy it is to voice text and how easy it recognizes the voice that it's hearing and translates that correctly? So lots of things in terms of usability and accessibility even. How many of you think about accessibility? What I would tell you is that if you have a website where you sell to consumers, there are legislations, depending on which country, which state, that require your applications be accessible. That means to people who are visually impaired and hearing impaired. So there's also a big market right now to make sure that you're reaching out to those consumers that aren't your traditional consumers, right? So they may be more visually impaired or hearing impaired. And do you have a solution to interface and interact with those consumers? Because they account for a large chunk of consumer spend. And are you even testing or thinking about that as an organization? Next slide. Mobile devices are personal. Next slide. We care very deeply about our devices and how our devices look. Why device manufacturers made it configurable is because they knew you'd want to change the screen. You'd want to change the look and feel. You'd want to change the organization of where the apps sit on your desktop. Because we all are, it's personal to us where we like them. I'm sure many of you have had this happen where a a particular icon or something gets changed or a color and we get annoyed, right? Because we're so used to it being that way. We like it a certain way. So be conscious as a tester. What have you changed that the consumer may not like that they can't change back or have the capability to modify? Because things are much more personal than they used to be. It's not like people go, here's the application, it's in blue and green and I like it that way. Now people expect the capability to customize and be able to change when they need to. Next slide. Love plus design equals dollars. It's a fact of life. If people love what you've got and like the design, they'll spend more money on it. Next slide. Users expect continuity of experience across their platforms. So for testers, we have to make sure that the interaction and interface on their laptop is the same as their cell phone, is the same as their tablet. Next slide. So what you want to see is this, this is an application. I would encourage you all to go look at it. It's very usable, super user friendly. It's um, actually able to be downloaded on a watch. So it's a really good wearable application where this company does scheduling for train service in Europe. They're able to have a wearable um, application that resides on a, a watch that you wear on your wrist that tells you basically you can have your ticket for the train. You can scan it. Um, the code that's on there, it tells you when the next train is coming. It tells you details about you know, different train traffic, things like that. But then you also have access to that information on your mobile device and the website. So they have to integrate now a wearable, a mobile device, and a website. So as testers, we have to be thinking about how is this integrating across the multiple devices and platforms we have to support. Next slide. Interactions have to be fast and responsive. What we're also seeing as a trend. Next slide. Performance testing is incredibly important on our applications. What you tend to see is when people see advertisements or you're pushing advertisements that the interest goes up. So if someone's advertising on the Super Bowl, the traffic they're going to see on their websites, their smartphones, and their tablets goes up. But what you can see the most is obviously when you look at this, when I talked about know where your consumers are using your technology, where people are accessing is their mobile device. And you can see that clearly when looking at this. Next slide. Responsive delivery is incredibly important. Next slide. Performance equals dollars as well. So remember I said love plus design equals money, performance equals money. Performance and stress testing are critical. So again, just like penetration testing, as a testing organization you have to have a strategy around your performance and stress testing. Next slide. So here's just some stats around speed, traffic, and revenue. Google found some stats around a slowdown equals a 20% decrease in ad revenue. Bing found a two-second slowdown meant a 2.5% decrease in queries and overall clicks. This is important if you have websites you're testing. Understand your baselines, understand where you need to be, and understand the impact if those baselines aren't met. Next slide. There is no technology silver bullet. Next slide. There's a lot of stuff out there. We talk about Xamarin, Objective-C, Java.net. Every day they're coming out with new technologies to help us be successful 
we as testers need to get familiar and get comfortable with new technologies every day. Because our development teams, our project management teams are going to come to us and say, hey, can you interact with this? And we're going to have to be ready for an answer with that. So be aware, there's no silver bullet. Not one thing is going to do it for us. It's probably going to be a toolkit that we're going to be needing to utilize for our testing. Next slide. Don't be afraid to build stuff knowing you might throw it away. It used to be we had to be afraid, oh my gosh, can we use this for the next three years? Next slide. But as testers, we, that may not be the case. As with Agile, we want to fail fast and often. We want to make sure that we are using automation, right? We automate, we monitor, we analyze, we go back into that workflow. Before, people would say, I can't automate because I don't know if I'll have time. We don't want to do that anymore. We want to say that has to be a critical component. With that 40% increase in spend on testing, we can't continue at that rate forever. That's not a sustainable pace for organizations. The way to get around that is look at key strategies around continuous integration and automation to be able to help you bridge that gap of spend on your testing. Next slide. Success for us, I love this slide, actually is going to mean the ability to integrate all of these concepts. Next slide. Nobody cares about security until they do. You as testers need to know this. Everyone will say it's not a problem for us until it is a problem. Next slide. Your brand and your image all has to do with whether or not you're able to build that trusted loyalty in your consumers. So make sure you're building the trust you need in the consumers and that will increase your revenues. If you fail to build that trust and you're not a brand people trust and has compromised their personal information and data, what we tend to see happen, build this slide, is that you end up in the papers, build this slide, and you end up tanking in terms of your revenues. Many companies, Home Depot, Target, others can attest to what happens when you're not able to secure your data. Next slide. Everyone needs a little security help. We can't do it on our own. Next slide. So there's a lot of regulations out there. There's a lot of information on this. We're not all experts on it. What we need to be able to do as testers is understand the high points and then get the help that we need. Next slide. You need a multidiscipline team. So in order to get this right, it's going to take various different people from various different disciplines. Next slide. So it's going to take your developers, your designers, your testers, who also are looking at user experience, your folks who are experts at security, and then the customer service people that pull it all together and the people who can market it, and making sure you're getting feedback from your consumer. So again, it's a multidiscipline team. The one thing I would caution for some of you out there is if you have your developers being your designers, you could be in trouble. Developers make great developers, but you need designers in your organization. It's very critical now with user experience. And what I would also tell you is testers today are much more diverse than just testing functionality. You have to understand performance. You have to understand UX. You have to understand user experience and design. It's a much more diverse set of people that you're looking at in order to test your applications today. Next slide. Employ a partner who can help you in these disciplines and speed your time to success and has the experience to make it work for you. Like I said, we'll fail a lot of times, but what can speed that for organizations and companies is employing testing partners who can help you in these disciplines. So what I would say is, again, an organization, you know, TAP QA, others out there, we specialize in being able to help people with solving these types of challenges and getting over these hurdles. We don't all know how to do it. You want someone who's done it before who can help you through these types of hurdles and get you to the end game and make you successful in the end. Next slide. So our final lesson for today, with our few minutes left, left is luck favors the prepared. Testers have known this throughout time. We always tend to be prepared. So be prepared for what's coming. Next slide. Are you embracing the changes that are taking place and adapting your testing and development practices accordingly? That's a question only you guys can ask yourselves out there, is if that's happening for you and your organization. The second question I would ask is, do you have the right partners to take you to the next level where you need to go inside of your organization and make sure that's the case as well? You want to make sure that you're leveraging the right people and that you're embracing the change 
you're making sure to adapt as a company and an organization. I appreciate all of you for logging in and taking the time out of your lunch hour today to spend with me on this. We'll talk a lot more in depth at the conference coming up in August, so I hope to see many of you out at the conference where we can engage and talk about this. And at the end, the net-net, the cheese has moved and will continue to move for all of us. I want you all to be part of the evolution. Testing is changing. The lab of the future may be a mock city or apartment, as I said. Use your resources, do your homework, and leverage your experts. Make sure you're doing all of those things. If you have any questions or need information, if we go to the next slide, there is my contact information. You can reach out to me with further questions or information that you need on this topic. I'm happy to help. Um, you can also reach out to Eric and PSQT, and they will be able to publish the information and get it to you. But I hope all of you learned something. I hope this was a successful session for you. If there's any questions, we have a few minutes for questions as well. I'll turn it over to Eric. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's a very interesting topic, very interesting webinar. I want to thank you for your time today, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar, sponsored by IIST, the leaders in education-based certifications and training. For more information on how IIST can improve help you or your organization, please visit www.iist.org. You can follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out more information about IIST news, events, and promotions. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope to see you in future IIST webinars, and have a great day. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.